much. So first of all, I'd like to thank the, the organizer. <laughs> Let me see if I can get it right. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer of the program for inviting me here. So thanks to Xavier, uh, Luke, Ankana, and Argir, and also to the uh, to the uh, organizers of the workshop. So thank you, Radu, Luke again, and. Oh, so close. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Very far back, it made it difficult. All right, so um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, also, it's, it's a good moment to thank uh, Stephen and Matthew for um, suggesting that, that my, my original title was, uh, was a bit too mystifying. <laughs> so I added a little bit of little bit of clarification. So the kind of concentration of the XMPD that we'll be looking at today will be um, that of weak convergence, so concentration and sequences. And they'll, these sequences will be uh, weakly convergent uh, sequences of linear PD, satisfying linear PD. So having said this, let me start with a very simple exercise in, in analysis. So. I remember when I was like an undergrad and there was this like the big integration thing, you know, like it was always very, very frustrating, you know, like you had these kind of like pointwise convergence and then the integrals didn't quite converge, you know, as I would have liked. It was one of the, the first things <laughs> in my life when I asked myself, why cannot math be simple? You know, I still ask myself this, but fortunately, I kind of figured out what, what's going on with Fatou's lemma. And I think if I if I had known the answer, or or at least well, let's let's get into it. So when is when can the equality fail there? Um, when is when is the inequality strict? Well, we kind of know that whenever these converge weakly, start to something that's strict to a measure that's strictly positive, at least on a, on on some set. So when they concentrate um, in the limit and. Um, what would be an example of this? And I chose an example that if someone told me this in undergrad, I probably would have quit math. I chose one example of like diffuse concentration, which goes as follows. So we take a function, which is just takes two values, zero and J, J is a large number. And it takes these values on small intervals that are of width one over J squared, and there's J of them. So it's basically charging Every every kind of like sub interval with about one. However, the intervals are so, are so small that the, the there's kind of like their length one over j squared and there's j of them. So the measure where this function is non-zero is of order one actually. And indeed, if j converges to zero in measure, then you can also change the weak star convergence to to the big measure. You get like a Riemann sum. So what's the what's the, the takeaway from this? The takeaway is that, well, there can be non-trivial effects, which are not even kind of like, they're not even um, concentration in the limit. You get like a completely, absolutely continuous limit, but there's, there's concentration effects hidden in, uh, in weak convergence. And in particular, the, the answer that we'll, we'll get into more depth later on, is that equality in Fatou lemma happens if and only if the sequence is uniformly integral. So for us, concentration will be failure of uniform integrability. And the the, uh, the obvious, so this is kind of like uh, now kind of like PDE free. The the kind of like the sequences we'll be looking at, they're uh, sequences of vector fields that um, satisfy certain linear PDE constraints. A linear PDE constraint is given, and this is kind of like um uh the 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 point where I, I mean so the the study of such integral uh, integral functionals on linear pd sequences i would say was i mean it's been in continuum mechanics for a long time and we've seen quite a few examples here this week um and but however the study that, that i'm doing kind of like is, is slightly removed from from the application so perhaps it would be a good, good point of conversation to see maybe we can take some of the theoretical developments and perhaps reapply it to, to some problems in, in mechanics. And in particular, the, this sort of formulation where we separate 
the, the differential information in a linear PD and the nonlinearity, uh, kind of like, let's say, isolated from the derivatives, this is kind of like at least how, vaguely speaking, how looked at our um, postulated that mechanics problems should be uh, should be formulated. And indeed, this viewpoint had kind of uh, numerous numerous kind of like applications in uh, in let's say mathematical physics and kind of like other other fields. Um, in particular, uh, so most of my talk will be pertaining to. How we uh, how we extend results that are known for let's say uh, so most results that I'll speak of are known from the history where where the PD on the right hand side is parallel and uh, and they, they'll pertain to how do we extend these results to general uh, PDs PD constraints. However, from from kind of like expository point of view. If you don't like the A, you can just think that the vector fields are sequences of gradients, and then you'll get kind of like a, a review of, uh, of classic literature. Okay, having said this, let me uh, let me uh, do a little, just a little <laughs> basic background in, uh, in functional analysis. So for me, weak convergence in LP, which is the, the main object we'll be, we'll be looking at today, is essentially a convergence of, of averages, the convergence of measurements, modulo LP bound. Uh, and um, <laughs> this is important because it's it's consistent with the idea of physical measurements, kind of like distributional, kind of like distributional, uh, um, the idea of distributions. And in particular, uh, we will, we, we are really, so a point to make here, is that we'll be really, really looking at circumstances when we genuinely have weak convergence. So if if uh, if for some reason the, the PD problem we're looking at is uh, uh, support some sort of strong convergence, then it's basically uninteresting. So I would say kind of like most most nonlinear functionals, <laughs> you don't need to be mild regularity, but no structural assumptions on uh, nonlinearity to give you from continuity. Okay, having said this, um, let me also zoom in on the gap between um, weak and strong convergence. So for this, let me recall kind of like a century old theorem of, of Vitali, the Vitali convergence theorem, which states that uh, weak convergence, sorry, strong convergence in LP, P less than infinity is equivalent to, to two things. One is uh, failure of oscillation or oscillating behavior. This is convergence in measure or convergence in probability. If you prefer the, the, um, more probability slang. And the second one is the, that of uniform integrability, which is basically saying that for, for large values, the, the sequence charges small sets kind of in the same way in, in LP1 or uniformly. Right, the, the statement here is obviously true for a single LP function. We, in this case, we, we want it uniformly. And it's, it's known from another kind of like century old, if not older, theorem from the De La Vallée Poisson criterion that uni uniform integrability is equivalent with slight aboundedness in slightly smaller spaces. And in particular, uh, kind of like an important factor for us today will be to have an extra log of, uh, of integrability. Um, of course, it would be instructive to give kind of like separated examples of each. It would be good to have um, a sequence which converges weakly and oscillates, but does not concentrate in the other way around. And for oscillating behavior, it's easy to look at one periodic oscillation, you know, finer and finer uh, oscillation, in which case, if you think about what does sine converge to an average, well, it would be zero, right? Because it's kind of like, uh, half positive, half negative, if you wish. Um, so it converges to zero. Uh, there cannot be any uh, concentration because it's uniformly bounded by one. However, it's also clear that it's there's a measure to be uh, kind of fine oscillation, so it's, it's kind of obvious. Um, on the other hand, uh, we can look for, for concentration. We'll look, we'll examine a much simpler example than the one on the first slide. We'll just take kind of like a point concentration in L2, 
I'll take the sequence which which uh, only charges the the interval zero one over j, and it charges it with the right with the right uh, um, amount, uh, so that kind of like the, the sequence in total has mass one, but it does not. So, but it converts it still converts to zero in weekly in L two. And this, of course, is not a nice, I mean, it's clearly converted uh, to zero. So having said this, um, one of the uh, underlying, so on one hand, we've seen that uh, strong convergence interacts with nonlinearity very well, perhaps too well. On the other hand, uh, we've seen, that, uh, I mean, we, we kind of like, we'd like to see how uh, nonlinearity interacts with uh, with weak convergence, and to this end, I'll take again the LPD constraints. Uh, the, the simplest nonlinearity there is, and kind of like correspond to to quadratic functionals, are known as usually energy um, in mechanics. So let's take just for uh, scalar fields the, the quantity z squared, and let's take the examples we had on the previous slide, and let's you know kind of like compute uh, what's the limit. In the in the energy and on the one hand, when you plug in, you plug in here. It's a simple uh, sin, uh, periodic oscillation of sine. It's a simple calculus exercise to see that this uh, is a constant. The, the, you still have a periodic oscillation, but it's strictly positive, right? Because it's squared. It. Whereas if you plug in, if you plug in integral uh, zero squared, you just get zero. So there's a, a genuine uh, there's a failure of weak continuity, and there's some some uh, uh, lower semi-continuity, genuine lower semi-continuity. The the example with uh, with the concentration at zero, it's it's kind of like it's uh, it's exactly the same. You 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 square it, you get exactly one for each term of the sequence, and the the lim and the limit you get zero. very simple. And the the takeaway is very clear. Um, we continue to forget about it. Uh, lower semi-continuity indeed seems like the the right. The right, uh, the right kind of like notion to think about for energy functionals, and indeed, perhaps I should have said this on the first slide: the the sequences of vector fields v, j, or whatever. In principle, for us, they would be like uh, think of them as minimizing sequence for which we already have an energy bound, which which gives weak compactness. That's more of the, the way to, to put it uh, to to uh, think about the VJs. In any case, either oscillation or concentration destroy weak continuity. So, so what is left? Well, there's lower semi-continuity left, as we know very well. Most most of the meeting was concerned with calculus of variations. Lower semi-continuity is very important, and indeed, let me remind you of a kind of like I don't know, probably like century-old result I would attribute it to Weierstrass, which which says that if you take or I don't know like like Cesari or Italian, but the, the, um, people thought about these things very long ago. And let, let's take, you know, a sequence which oscillates between two values. And uh, let's let's see what, what, what it does for lower semi-continuity. Well, you plug it in, you get that, I mean, the the, the if I let it, if I let um, DJ oscillate periodically between A and B with volume fraction a half, the integral here will respect the volume fraction, it will evaluate as phi of A, phi of B. And on the right, the limit converges to the average. On the right, I will get uh, phi of half A plus half B. And of course, this is convexity. And we, we also know that in general, if we want the, the magic quantity that's um, a lower semi-continuous with respect to all LP sequences, this would be a convex function. Okay, so um, and I kind of like I attributed to Weierstrass because you know he probably knew how to do it. So you know, we're very much efficient to get a bigger result assigned to you regardless of whether you actually proved it in this form or not. But I'm pretty sure he kind of I mean convexity implies lower semi-continuity for kind of topological reasons and Weierstrass for this particular. So let's let's kind of like put the PDE in and kind of like energies from mechanics and take a model. For the Dirichlet energy, if you wish, when we take uh, uh, the energy assigned to a deformation u to be function of the gradient, well, this is very well understood. For I mean, when when are these weakly lower semi-continuous ensemble spaces? 
the answer is definitely when you have convexity, but not only. So in particular, it's, it's actually true whenever you have convexity with respect to gradients. What do I mean by this? Let's, let's kind of like read out the, the, the definition because it's, it's somehow important. We have Jensen's inequality. Or let's, say, let's say we don't have a gradient here. Let's say we have average phi of u bigger than phi of average u for, uh, for um, uh, functions u. This is Jensen's inequality. And now I'm saying this is like Jensen's inequality, but I restrict, I restrict the competitors inside the nonlinearity to just uh, gradients of periodic vector fields. So this the kind of like the relevance of this notion for calculus of variations and lower semi-continuity kind of kind of in general was what we acknowledged long ago, probably even before Mori. And <coughs> the problem with this in comparison to to convexity is that well, I mean <laughs> And that you, you check a local condition, you check qualitivity of second order derivatives. But the convexity in general is non local. I would say informally that it's very nasty. And just to, to make it clear that there are uh, non convex examples that do this, let me just list convex functions of the term. This would be kind of like the first kind of non convex, but quite a convex function one can, uh, one can come up with. Um, do you do that on cubes or on torus? Torus, sorry. Yes. It could be localized. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you integrate the periodic, the derivative is it zero. No. It's the average of the gradient. Gradient globally should integrate to zero. Yeah. You should localize it. Yeah, 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 because otherwise it's zero. Yeah. The notion is localized. Ah, it's it's cubes. ah, I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, okay. In every cube, yeah. the usual yeah. definition. Yes, yes. So it should read, let's say, x plus. Yeah, right, right. I apologize for this. Let's, uh, let's fix it. So how could it be? It should be so it should be on the one hand on the right we should have x and on the on the other we should have phi of yeah yeah that should be mm -hmm. it's not x it's any matrices. Yes, you're right. Thank you. So, and this will be, I mean, yeah, we should, also the generalizations that, that come on, should come, uh, come up later should be understood like this. Yes, thank you. I was a little bit too, too eager to make the formula as clean. <laughs> Okay, so having said this, um, let's. Okay, so the um, the plan would be to try to generalize this for other TV constraints apart from apart from curl free, and the the kind of like the okay. Nevertheless, the what was kind of the, the idea of the term is that. On the one hand, when you're looking at lower semi-continuity of functionals that are uh, lower semi-continuous with respect to sequence, weakly converted sequences of gradients, on the one hand, uh, the kind of like the, the notion that characterizes them is a Jensen inequality with respect to gradients. And we're looking for, for something similar to the different uh, TV constraints. In particular, if we examine this question, for which nonlinearities do we have uh, lower semi-continuity with respect to all A-free sequences? Um, here we'd expect a similar notion to emerge. So 
first of all, uh, let's, I mean, there's of course a kind of like a question of, of, uh, of need. I mean, do we really are really interested to do this for a reason? And I list here a few, uh, a few examples, one of which there's an example of the quantum geometry, like uh, exterior derivatives uh, on, uh, um, and the of these, I would particularly stress the, the divergence operator, which, which does come up a lot. And um, in particular, on, on different subspaces of matrices. So I've seen recently uh, people looking at divergence on, on symmetric uh, on symmetric matrices, this is like an uh, um, adjoint of uh, a symmetric gradient, and it's, it's definitely uh, something that's much more difficult to study than divergence alone because the symmetry couples the, the equation. You have an x vector, you have divergence three plus a linear equation and anti symmetric parties. Um, and of course, uh, well, there's the, the, the case in which A3, the, the A3 sequences are. Uh, uh, symmetric gradients. Okay, um, so to do this, we to, to kind of like the, the tool that, that we employ is particularly suited for, for the interaction between nonlinearity and weak conversion. And it's the, the notion for us, for, 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 the, for this talk in particular, is the notion of generalized Young measures. Um, so how do you, how, how, do, how does one present this um, uh, in, in relatively simple terms? Let's ignore the second, the second, uh, the second term for a while and let's think, let's, uh, let's look at uh, the, the, this, uh, this paradigm I've seen in one of, uh, in one of Tartar's reports. So let's let the, the, uh, see the weekly convergence sequence VJ act on the nonlinearity by put forward. And let's put ourselves in a situation where we really, we were looking at a VJ, which is weakly converging in, in a uniformly bounded sequence. So in this case, we'd have omega times some compact set, some open ball. And in this case, we'd have uh, the measures are um, bounded on a space on the space in that case will look will look uh, will be something like uh, will be just measures omega times a. And of course, we can we can kind of like very good. In this sort of space, we have very good compactness properties, as we all know. And more importantly, uh, we also have uh, the, the technique of disintegration, in which if I let these uh, Put forwards have a limit, a limit mu. And here we can disintegrate it and write mu as a uh, Lebesgue measure times a family of, of probability measures. And these probability measures in particular will encode the, the oscillation. Of the of the weekly convergent sequence VJ, uh, we can think of the the uh, extension to to the concentration part. <laughs> what we do when we have instead of a compact set of values k here, when we have the full space and we're examining the what will turn out to be the defect measure lambda. This would be the this would turn out to measure. The uh, the kind of like what what do the large values of D J do when compared to the to the P norm? So the the second part takes the behavior of phi compared to P norm at infinity and looks at the concentrations of uh, of the, the sequence. So let me try to illustrate this with uh, with a couple of examples. Um, and the first one will be uh, kind of like a uniformly bounded one when we have just oscillation. We take the, the same example as before. Here you have the oscillation between A and B with one fraction half. And in, uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, 
we, we have that the, the oscillation that parameterizes the, the, the wheel convergence the oscillation measure is just half uh, Dirac at A, half Dirac at B. This is kind of like, I mean, like a standard kind of like laminate behavior. Um, in, in terms of concentration, let's take a very similar sequence to the one we had, uh, to, the, to the point concentration we had before, but let me give it kind of like a, some sort of cancellation flavor. Let's say we put a positive concentration uh, around the point three up with mass one, and another concentration around three with uh, with uh, mass kind of like negative one. All together, the sequence converges to zero weakly. However, it has a concentration effect of uh, of two magnitude two, let's say, concentrated <laughs> three. And in particular, if you sit at three and you think how are these, how are the large values distributed, they're distributed fairly evenly, you know, half up, half down. Of course, if I put uh, if I put like a four here, I don't know, then the volume fraction would change. It would get four over five positive, uh, one over five negative, this sort. And again, let's let's look at the, the, the example, the diffuse concentration example from the previous slide. In this case, um, basically the, the whole interval is covered with, with small pieces. There's no convergence in measure because there's convergence in measure to zero because these cover very little of the interval. There's one over J in total. Uh, and so but there's uh, there's a uniform positive concentration effect which is distributed evenly around around zero. Um, I could say that I'm using two two notations for for Young measures. One is uh, weak star convergence in this space in a kind of like space of Young measures, and the other one also has an arrow with p to the node uh, in which in which uh, there's a kind of like this will come up slightly later. Um, and finally, it's worth to know that we can reconstruct the limit. Uh, of, uh, of the sequence, you can reconstruct it from the from the Young measure itself. So in particular, perhaps I should say here, I use the, the bar to denote average. This would be nu x is a probability measure. Um, this is its expectation. Or very centered. Okay, so it would be very good to actually quantify, you know, what oscillation, concentration, or failure thereof means in terms of young measure. And in particular, and, and these are actually very, very robust. On the one hand, you have that convergence in measure is equivalent with the oscillation measures being deterministic. And in this case, in particular, if we look, if we revisit the example, the, the Fatu example, let's say this. Uh, we don't really need to, but let, let's imagine we did. Um, and say this is, I don't know, positive. Um, the, the oscillation measures would retrieve the limit with the inequality. And the, the concentration part describes exactly this gap, this defect. And in particular, the concentration measure is the same as the what you think of the, the de defect measure and other another part of the literature. It's exactly the, the weak star limit of the gap of Vj converging, uh, failing to converge to V strongly in LP. So and we, we get we get more than this, not only do we get the defect measure, but also we see we, we get a kind of like uh, the, the statistic that tells us kind of like how the, the directions of concentration interact with so that, that's very nice and very helpful and on the other hand uh, we we also have uh, a characterization of uniform variability so this is failure of a, of a sequence to to concentrate is equivalent with the second uh, yeah with the second integral being uh, zero Right, so this this will enable us to study kind of like concentration cancellation. We're, we're, we're particularly and kind of like most of my talk is particularly interested in cases where you have a defect measure, but the interaction that you have, but also you have the correct interaction between the nonlinearity and uh, the, the sequence, so that you 
you have uh, you have the the second term disappear not because lambda is zero but because uh, the first term is zero. So we'll, we'll get to this in a second. And in particular, if you're if you're in this in this position, it's very uh, easy to to retrieve the, the the statement that's known as fundamental theorem of young measures. And it's basically saying that if I want to represent the limit of uh, the sequence of energies in terms of the oscillation measure only. Then I have to have no no concentration. That's more or less, I mean, this was proved by Young and third. Um, so yeah, generalized air measures, generalized by by Young was uh, thinking about in the first place for for problems in calculus and variations. So one very simple kind of like let's say pedagogical, if you wish, way to use Young measures to retrieve lower semi-continuity. Let's let's go back to kind of uh, Weierstrass's theorem. And say if I have a convex integrand, I want to do uh, lower semi-continuity along uh, an LP sequence. Um, how do I do this? Well, I write the, the representation. I also kind of like make things very easy for me by imposing phi uh, to be positive. So in this case, there will be no contribution from the from the concentration part, just by the time. That's kind of like a toy toy example. And I take uh, here, because I have convexity, and this is a probability measure. Here, I apply Jensen's inequality between the orange terms, and then at the end, I, I use the fact that uh, the, the Young measure represents the limit uh, in exactly this way. So very simple, you know. You 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 invest in learning all the machinery, and in the end, you can output proofs like this and uh, and be happy. And one one thing to to stress is that the only kind of like analysis we did here, or the only inequality actually we applied here was uh, Jensen at, at this point. We'll come back to this. As we're, we're going back to the, to the lower semi-continuity question, um, now we, uh, we're, we're trying to investigate weekly uh, lower semi-continuity along weekly convergent sequences that satisfy an a free condition. And the condition on the nonlinearity, the restriction on the nonlinearity that we'll have is that it has to satisfy um, Jensen's inequality with respect to a free a free sequences, and this this slide should suffer exactly the same exactly the same modification as uh, as the one that Rado pointed out. It should be let's measure the the deviation from from the average for all x in in our end. Uh, on for all vectors x dimensions change and for all um, a three sequences with with average so it's but the the, the, the point remains um, lower semi continuity along all a three sequences if and only if a simplified not simple but simplified condition that you should have Jensen with respect to Essentially, to a free sequences. Um, so, how how do we do this, or what what was done in this direction? Well, first of all, there have to be some restrictions on the on the linear PD because you know linear PDs in general they're they're an absolute term that we can have. We can have elliptic or parabolic just by changing one sign, right? So, in particular, the class that has been identified as um, um, I think for, for this implication was that of constant rank differential operators. So for us, the operators will be homogenous. This is not a restriction. It's just kind of like to make things uh, simpler. But what's important is that the principal part uh, defines a matrix valued polynomial, which has constant rank away from the trivial zero. So what does this mean? Well, it's a bit like ellipticity, and it's really a very good class to do uh, harmonic analysis estimates. In. So, and then I'll stop at this. It's kind of like quotient elliptic. Um, there is there's fudge decomposition based on elliptic starting from this. And the, the claim that we that we that was proved by Fonseca and Miller is that if you 
if you if you study the, the lower semi-continuity problem and you basically rule out concentration by taking the sequence to, to converge in a slightly better space than, uh, than the growth of the nonlinearity, then you have lower semi-continuity. How did they do this? They proved the answers inequality for a funny coupling, like phi is now quasi-convex, it's not uh, it's not necessarily uh, convex, but it still satisfies Jensen with respect to, to the yeah. measures that are generated by a free sequence. So it's kind of like it's a, it's a if you wish a sort of duality, a quasi-convexity, a free young measures. Um, what we did was to show that actually quasi-convexity prevents uh, prevents uh, uh, concentration effects as well. Right? So basically, for Fonseca Miller, when you write this out in terms of uh, young measures, you have an oscillation part, and that's it. The, for us, we, we actually uh, we actually proved that we have a, this is not really Janssen inequality. It's like a Janssen replacement for uh, for concentrations, really for lambda almost every. So it's possible to have a concentration, but quasi convexity and uh, AFPI measures are are uh, paired together correctly. And maybe I do say a word about, about the proof here. So what would you like to do? You have this, you have this setup. So you have a setup where you have a linear PDE and the, kind of like the basic example would be like, like Maury's theorem. You have a sequence of gradients. They're curl free. What do you do? You kind of like solve the second, you solve the linear uh, equation. You plug in red uj here and you do more. So the Colonia had kind of like this the same statement. Well, if we did have this homological kind of relation, then we could do a lot of things. And this was great. Um, and it's it's also, however, if you study kind of like some uh, Homological algebra, you see that the, the condition here is purely, purely, kind of, I mean, can be stated fairly easily in terms of commutative algebra only, and it's not very nice. I don't think it's amenable, for instance, to Fourier yeah. estimates in general. You cannot do estimates for, for this. In turn, what I realized uh, a few years ago is that, the on the other hand, for exactly constant triangle operators, which were the one used by Murai in 81, Fosega Muller in 91, the main context, you really, really get the, the correct homological relation for analysis. Namely, you get an exact sequence like this, but crucially in Fourier space. And that's nice. I mean, that, that you can actually work with, that you can develop estimates for. And actually some of them were, were actually developed, you know, like early 70s. So kind of like what's the, what's the philosophy to reduce from nonlinearity coupled with linear PDE to what was known before. Well, once you kind of like throw away the, the remainder from, from this, you reduce to uh, functionals that depend only on, on potential uh, potentials like so. And then perhaps if you're lucky, you even pretend B is just a normal normal derivative and you reduce to Maury's proofs or, or, or other, other results that you want to that you want to apply this recipe for. So what what implications this has, for instance, is that well, it, it's it's better better read it from here. If you take a C, an A free sequence which converges weakly in LP and how I mean the constant condition will be assumed throughout and forth, even if it's not explicitly written, then on the one hand, you add for gradients, you can separate the oscillation and the concentration in two parts that respect the PD. So it was kind of like known essentially only for gradients before. But what we showed is that if you have a free, not only do you get these guys to be a free, but you, you actually uh, get, get the oscillation and concentration effects only in terms of, of this potential operator. Uh, and in the language of young measures, you can say that, well, the oscillation alone is generated by a free sequence. The concentration alone is generated by an A. And that's uh, that's very useful, particularly when we want to prove the Jensen or Jensen-like inequalities that, that we use in the proof. 
Um, and secondly, one can think, okay, but this is P between one and infinity. Why did you get this? Well, because uh, Fourier. So um, what about P equals one? For, for P equals one, it was known that if you start with a sequence of gradients and you look at, so imagine P is one here, new X, so this matter, new X and no concentration, even though you start with gradients, uh, you, you can generate any L1 Young measure. So at the top, for gradients, the gradient structure is destroyed. Something that I realized more or less last year was that for constant, and it was kind of like widely believed, you know, like you have PDE here, no PDE here. I mean, the second one has to be destroyed as well. <coughs> this is not the case. So you have a, a result in which even though you start with A3, you, you, might, you might run into a situation where new, the oscillation has nothing to do with the PDE. The concentration always respects the PDE. And this was not observed. I mean, this was not, as I was saying, most of the stuff is pertaining to a free framework. This is for gradients alone. It's not, it's, this is for BV, let's say, completely new. And um, yeah, we're, we're kind of like, the, the problem with this is that the proof is uh, in the back. And we'd really like to give a direct proof. And I think we have uh, we have a strategy to, to, to isolate the concentration in the, in the right way. But that's, that's more for the future. So um, how much, like five minutes? Thank and, you. Yeah. Okay. So I will, and people, so part of this is saying, of course, I mean, let's say uh, the, the, the original result, there can be no uh, decomposition lemma for P equal one. This is actually quite clear. However, you, we can characterize weak convergence in, uh, in uh, uh, a, a three measures. We can characterize it at least in terms of Jensen type inequalities. And, and this, uh, <coughs> It's um, well. It's definitely of a, a, a more technical nature, and that that's probably worth uh, a talk a talk of its uh, of its own. However, I would like to say something much uh, much softer. I'd like to, to make the the following point. So, why is quasi convexity fundamental? Is the point, and how do I think about this? Well, yes, and inequalities. Uh, in essence, inequality joins convexity with uh, with weak convergence via lower semi-continuity. So kind of like what what we have is that or, or what we, we sort of discussed is we have weak convergence in LP and these will generate some some young measures mu x uh, lambda mu x infinity these are like all young measures or all, all probability measures. And uh, these are linked with, uh, with all, all convex functions by. And I guess for, for, for convexity, you, you only need oscillation measures. The point I'm trying to make is that by analogy, if you're looking at weak convergence of gradient, you, you obtain some gradient band measures, which are mysterious objects, but they're, they're you know, they're, they're um, I mean, you can prove things about them using measure theory and functional analysis. And on the other hand, you have uh, quite the complex one. Results like, like this one, are basically saying that as long as we're concerned with weak convergence, we can we can uh, take we can prove that the class of weakly convergent sequences here, which is ubiquitous in like you know analysis, using these tools, we see it's equivalent with the class of quasi-convex functions, which are at least defined by a simple form. <laughs> However, we see that they have to be there has to be a sort of uh, uh, conservation of difficulty in mathematics. However, 
we have another object to look at, which is much easier to characterize, for instance, for quadratic forms or whatnot. And um, in the same flavor, if we're looking at weak convergent like uh, A3 sequences in, in uh, LP, then these are characterized by A young measures, and we reach the, the, the class of, of A quasi complex functions. Um, so, in, in this sense, <laughs> exactly characterizes weak convergence in Sobolev or PV spaces. And of course, it's, it's another way of, of stressing out how important Mori's problem is, which I will not, which I will not state here. Um, however, let me say a couple of words about weak continuity, which is to say, so the, this statement here is taking the lower semi-continuity from before and saying, okay, if I have plus, if plus minus no, if phi is quasi-convex, then I get instead of lower semi-continuity, I get weak continuity. But what's the upshot of, of this? Well, uh, on the one hand, it's nice because it's really a phenomenon of concentration cancellation, which is, I mean, okay, that's pretty cool. And the, the bonus is that instead of quasi-convexity, which we don't know, um, I mean, we, we cannot characterize, we can, as a byproduct of the proof, nonlinearities, the non Lagrangians, if you wish, we can characterize exactly up the computation of a large linear algebraic system. And there, they always have a cancellation uh, property, which uh, I will just say vaguely, it's it's like for determinant. So with this, I stop because I wanted to to connect this phenomenon of concentration cancellation with the result that I think everyone here is very well aware of. It's the extra log of integrability proved by Stefan Muller, which was done in, a, in exactly a, step, a setup of, of concentration cancellation, namely that uh, they, uh, um, if you have the exactly LN bound, you actually get an extra log. So for sequences, you'll have, you'll have uniform integrability. And this was generalized by Koifman, Lyons, Meyer, and Sens uh, to, to Hardy spaces and also some other uh, compensated compactness quantities. And in particular, they asked if you have uh, um, compensated compactness nonlinearity, do you always get the extra log? And uh, with Andre Guerra, we proved in, in the same paper that it's that yes, you do for constant rank operators. And uh, of course, let me beat the, the dead horse into the ground and say, well, uh, you can have concentration here, but not here. That's that the meaning of the statement in the end. And I will conclude after this one slide when I, I realized, like a couple of like last month in February or something, I realized that you know uh, Miller's result and then the results of this flavor already give you a sign in the nonlinearity, but we already have. Or, or quasi convex here, quasi affine. Uh, here, um, I, I flipped, uh, I just flipped the inequality. Um, we already have an inequality. So, in the setup described here, we already have concentration cancellation. Do we also have, um, uh, do we also have the L log L improvement? And the, the answer is yes. So, what was the takeaway from this, which is also new for for uh, for, uh, for radians? If you take what Miller did, um, you, you put a sign and you use a null Lagrangian to get uh, to get the L log L improvement. These guys they thought it's about compensated compactness, and of course they're I mean okay. However, it's since you already impose a sign here, you might as well, you actually get away with quasi-convexity alone. So for instance, if you try to do Miller result in, in, uh, in L2, instead of determinant, you can get um, minors, right? I mean, you keep the dimension, but change the, and get the L log L. But actually, the, if, if you try to solve uh, this question in, in quadratic forms alone, with uh, with inequality, with quasi concavity as it is here, you get a lot more quadratic forms that obey 
like uh, like Miller's uh, like Miller's improvement. So yeah, that was the best. Thing.